Hey, what's up, Union alum? Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to Union. Welcome to Reunion 2021. We're so glad you could join us for this year's virtual reunion. Where we've come together to reunite with our community safely. Reflect on a year of global challenge. And rejoice in our faith and our mission of service to the church, academy, and society. Now, more than ever, our community is called to truly change the world by bringing a religiously grounded, critical, and yet compassionate presence to the major personal, social, political, and scientific realities of our time. We hope the reunion programming planned for this week will leave you feeling enriched and also reconnected to Union. We celebrate your return and we appreciate you for your bountiful support. Through your prayers, through your giving, and through your ongoing devotion. As my Danish family says, mangitak, which is simply thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. I can't wait to see you and enjoy the week. Um, and it is my delight to introduce Dr. Collins to, to all of you. She is Emeritus Professor of Political Science, William Patterson University, shout out for New Jersey, um, and former director of its graduate program in public policy and international affairs. She contacted us this winter about this book that she had written about the, our union alum and international social justice activist, George Hauser. George is unknown to me until now, and I am grateful to Dr. Collins for bringing his amazing story to my attention and for her willingness to share the depth of her knowledge about him with the wider Union alumni, alumni community. All right, a few logistics. Um, we, so we're all on screen, um, and afterwards we would love to have a conversation after Dr. Collins' presentation. You may either um, put your questions in the chat or if you have a statement to make, you can simply unmute yourself, um, or sort of use the raise your hand feature and I'll call upon you um, to really give whatever it is you would like to offer to the conversation. Um, there's also this conversation is being recorded. So if you prefer not to be recorded uh, during your, uh, with your question, simply put it in the chat and I'll ask it for you. So it is, I'm gonna give you a little bit of further background on Dr. Collins and her bio, it'll, it'll be really quick, but I think it's worth mentioning. She's very, and a very accomplished professor. Sheila D. Collins is Emeritus Professor of Political Science, William Patterson University, and former director of its graduate program in public policy and international affairs. She is the author or co-author of seven books and numerous books, articles, book chapters, and encyclopedia entries on American politics and public policy, social, social movements, and religion. Her blogs have appeared on Truthout, Huffington Post, Oxford University Press, New Politics, and Religious Dis Dispatches. Before going into academia, Collins worked for a national church agency as co and as coordinator of a policy network of activist academics on issues of full employment and adequate income. In 1984, she served as National Rainbow Court Coordinator of the Jesse Jackson for President primary campaign and wrote the definitive book on that campaign. Collins co-chairs the Columbia University Seminar on Full Employment, Social Welf Welfare and Equity. She is also a co-founder and board member of the National Jobs for All Network and is a member of the Global Ecological Integrity Group, an international network of scholars and activists working on issues related to climate change. She attended Union from 1962 to 1963 and taught a women in ministry course there from 1976 to 1977. She is married to the Reverend John Collins, who is also on this call today, and is the mother of two daughters and five grandchildren. And I believe her aunt is also on the call for some of you who may have entered a little later. Uh, so without further ado, I present to you, Dr. Sheila Collins. Well, thank you so much, Rita, and um, for this opportunity to 
tell you about a very interesting person who is uh, very much connected with union. <clears throat> I first met George Hauser sometime in the latter half of the 1970s. He was then in his mid 60s and not too far from retirement from the American Committee on Africa, which he had founded in 1953. The American Committee on Africa, or ACOA as I'll refer to it, was the longest lasting US-based organization working in solidarity with the peoples of Africa for liberation from colonialism to have survived through the Cold War. And its offices in lower Manhattan were a floor above those of clergy and lady concerned, which my husband then headed. It wasn't until later after George's retirement from the ACOA that our paths kept crossing more often at various peace and social justice events in the New York metropolitan area. One of those was at Union in 1996, when my husband and I and George were invited to be discussants on a retrospective panel on the civil rights movement. Since we had so many interests in common, our circle of friends and fellow travelers kept bringing us together. It wasn't until later, however, when I was contemplating what I might do after my retirement that I decided to ask George if anyone was working on his biography. His answer was that he'd been thinking of writing his own story, but had never gotten around to it. I was surprised because several people whom, with whom he had worked intimately over the years had had their biographies or autobiographies published. People like Bayard Rustin, James Farmer, A.J. Musty, Martin Luther King Jr., David Dellinger, and Oliver Tombo to name a few. And so I found it peculiar that no one had written about Hauser, whose life has touched so many of the same chords. After I decided to write the book, he sent a note to say that though he was very pleased that I had taken on this project, he had mixed feelings about it. I've lived, through, lived during exciting times, he said, and have managed to latch on to some of the historical developments that have made this period meaningful. I've played a role, but I certainly do not exaggerate my contribution. I wouldn't want to make it more than it is, unquote. I think Hauser was far too modest. It wasn't until I started working on this book that I was able to appreciate just how far reaching and significant his work for peace and social justice had been. Now, in a seminal book on the civil rights movement, Alvin Morris argued that movements that change the course of history don't spring up spontaneously, but are the work of countless unsung organizers who prepare the soil ahead of time. Hauser was just such a man, a pioneer who set the stage for others. Perhaps because he was a white man whose life was devoted to working for freedom and justice for people of color, his name is relatively unknown, except to those closely connected to the movements he initiated. Yet as Julius Neri, first president of Tanzania said of him, quote, the most important people in the world are often those who work quietly in the background of events, devoting their lives to the causes in which they believe. Without them, there would be no triumph. George Hauser is such a man, unquote. Hauser was a man of seemingly contradictory parts. Although a deeply committed pacifist, he later supported those engaged in armed struggle in Africa. He was a white man who dedicated his life to the liberation of peoples of color, a devout Christian who worked with people of different faiths or none at all, as well as with those who had varying ideological commitments, seeing his work for freedom and self-determination as his ministry. He was an internationalist long before the world was connected through the internet. A man who took the long view of history and was quick to seize the fulcrums of change years before that change was recognized by the larger society. He was a gentle man who was nevertheless drawn to risk and adventure. A fearless man who rarely talked about the courage it took to, to risk, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, took to take up in popular causes, to build organizations with no funding, and to risk his life in the service of others. He was a man who liked to be the in, in the center of action, yet remained in the background, rarely seeking prominence. And he was a devoted family man, the father of four children, 
who nevertheless spent a great deal of time on trips abroad. Over the course of his life, George would come to know and work with most of the great figures of the American civil rights movement, as well as all of the emerging leaders of the African anti-colonial movements. He was born in 1916 and lived to the age of 99. And during all of his adult years, he never ceased his work for social justice. Therefore, to provide a context for his work, I had to immerse myself in a great deal of history. <clears throat> I thought I was pretty familiar with the 1930s, a period during which he came of age, as I've written and taught about Roosevelt and the New Deal. But in researching his life, I also discovered some things about that period that I was largely ignorant of. Likewise, his early civil rights work was only sketchily known by me, but it was his work in Africa that forced me to give myself a crash course in modern African political history. Hauser's archives are voluminous and scattered across four or five different university collections. So it took me over a dozen years to produce the final manuscript. Hauser's international outlook was forged early on by his having spent five of his childhood years as a son of missionaries in the Philippines, as well as a year as a college exchange student in China. In the first chapter, I've made extensive use of letters he wrote home to his parents during his year abroad. In them, we see the gradual development of his character from that of an idealistic but naive young man into a thoughtful, more sophisticated, and more politically astute person as he encounters a culture so very different from his own and wrestles with its implications for his own life and religious orientation. The first chapter also examines several important socio-political currents of the interwar years that also contributed to shaping his character and life commitments. These included a vibrant pacifist movement, a grounding in the social gospel, and a militant student movement that had both secular and religious offshoots like the Christian Student Movement or SCM. The student movement led young people like George to question both the logic and value of American capitalism and its connection with the war machine. This of course dovetailed with the isolationism that was the zeitgeist of the 1930s. As early as 1913, race relations emerged as an issue within the SCM. Following World War I, pacifism and economic justice emerged along with concerns about racism. With its emphasis on student leadership in the service of a peaceful and just human community, the SCM would groom many young people for leadership roles in progressive movements worldwide. Hauser was among those who received this training and as were several people with whom he worked over the coming years. Hauser found his calling in the Methodist student movement, a denominational offshoot of the Christian student movement and the most militant of all the religious student movements. As a high school and college student, he attended summer and weekend institutes at which internationally renowned social gospel evangelists like Sherwood Eddy and Kirby Page exposed the racism and imperialism lurking within American exceptionalism and inspired students to commit themselves to eradicating these evils. Other influences during this time were the Socialist Party and its youth wing, the Young People's Socialist League, which George would join and the contemporary example of Gandhi's nonviolent direct action as a means of social change. In addition, there was the Oxford Pledge. In 1933, Oxford University students had pledged to refuse to fight for king and country. And this pledge was replicated in the United States. During its peak years from 1936 to 1939, the US student movement mobilized about half the student body in one hour strikes against war. Hauser's father, a Methodist Episcopal clergyman, had envisioned that his son would take the path he had chosen. The senior Hauser had served pulpits in several cities in the United States 
as well as a stint as a missionary. George, however, rejected his father's path as too comfortable. He feared that the allure of being a popular minister at a big church with a large salary would cause him to compromise his principles. The second chapter of the book covers his years as one of a group of eight radical pacifists who attended Union from 1938 to 1940. When the first peacetime draft was announced in 1940, <clears throat> excuse me, these men were the first to resist registration, even though as seminarians, they could have been exempt from service for, ref for refusing even the status of conscientious objection. They were convicted of a felony and sent to prison for nearly a year. The Union Aid, as they were called, received national notoriety for the rejection of what they called the war machine. Articles about their refusal appeared in all the major newspapers and in the movie newsreels of the day. They were unsupported by the seminary president and faculty, which included Reinhold Niebuhr, and paid for their refusal with nearly a year in prison, some of, some of it spent in solitary confinement. Hauser and his fellow war resistors set the example for war resistors who would follow, as well as launching a movement inside prison that challenged the petty authoritarianism and racism of the system. News of their examples soon spread to COs in other prisons, culminating eventually in the desegregation of parts of the prison system. <clears throat> Hauser's prison experience gave him a great deal of time to think about what he wanted to do with his life. It was a turning point, setting him on his life's trajectory, and after it, there would be no turning back. I've made extensive use of Hauser's prison letters to both his seminary friend, Richard Roger Shin, and to his future wife, Jean Moline. In his letters to Shin, we see him wrestling with questions of resistance to militarism and the efficacy of minority action. Shin had his own internal battle about whether to accept the seminarian's exemption from the draft. With his wavering convictions about pacifism, Shin was a perfect interlocutor for Hauser, each of them posing questions and critiques of the other's positions on the best way of responding to the threat of Nazism. Shin would go on to fight as an inf infantryman at the Battle of the Bulge, endure 171 days of brutal interrogations by the Nazis and a 600 mile forced march through Germany during the waning days of the war. As you all know, he would later assume a position as professor of ethics at Union and write war and rumors of war. But the two men remained lifelong friends. Hauser's letter to Jean, which I've also used, revealed letter, prison letters to Jean, which I have also used, reveal the development of sweet epistolary courtship that was to culminate in a marriage of over 70 years. Excuse me. On his release from prison, <clears throat> Hauser was unable to return to Union because he and his comrades had refused to promise that they would bring no more negative publicity to the seminary. He was welcomed, however, at Chicago Theological Seminary, whose president was also a pacifist, and he would finish his senior year there. While he was in prison, A.J. Musty, who was then heading the Fellowship of Reconciliation, had offered him a part-time job as student field organizer in Chicago after his release. Hauser's job <clears throat> would be to organize students into cells to study books on Gandhi's method of direct, nonviolent direct action with the hope that they could then utilize that method, <clears throat> excuse me, in the cause of peace. Their texts were Gandhi's autobiography, Richard Gregg's The Power of Nonviolence, and Krishnalal Sridharani's War Without Violence, which is the first systematic explanation of Gandhi's Satyagraha. Within a few months, 17 cells were operating throughout the Chicago area. Hauser, however, however and two of Musty's other recruits, Bayard Rustin and James Farmer, 
was soon drawn to Gandhi's method to tackle racial discrimination in public accommodations, housing, and transportation. The cells he organized in Chicago in time became the basis for the foundation of the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, a national federation of autonomous groups scattered in northern and border states across the country. In 1945, CORE elected Hauser as its part-time unsalaried executive secretary. He served in that capacity for over a decade, decade while also holding down a job with the FOR. Because he was CORE's coordinator, the early CORE efforts bore the imprint of his approach to nonviolent direct action. Hauser insisted that the organization be interracial. As he put it, quote, while Negroes would form the mass base of such an organization, the movement must not exclude white persons from membership. Such a movement has a strategic advantage <clears throat> against white bigots, as it would be impossible for race baiters to say that they were being persecuted simply by Negroes. The fact that Negroes and whites are working together in the same organization undermines the racist theory that the two races can't mix. And finally, it gives white persons who are anxious to oppose discrimination an opportunity for real action, unquote. Hauser also insisted, <clears throat> excuse me, that the end result of any action should be reconciliation. His guidelines for direct action campaigns stressed that civil disobedience was to be used as a last resort after other kinds of interventions had failed. <clears throat> Although segregation was outlawed in the North, there was considerable de facto segregation. Throughout the 1940s, the subject of the book's third chapter, CORE would model the repertoire of civil disobedience tactics that would be adopted by the civil rights activists of the 1960s. Sit-ins and stand-ins, picketing, boycotts, marches, negative publicity, and so on. Actions were taken at roller skating rinks, restaurants, hotels, theaters, amusement parks, swimming pools, public beaches, playgrounds, and barber shops, and on public transportation. As early as 1947, Hauser and Rustin organized the first Freedom Ride into the South, dubbed the Journey of Reconciliation. The NAACP refused to support the ride fearing that it would stir up too much violence, although individual NAA lawyers along the route would provide help. Not all of the core campaigns ended in immediate victory. Campaigns against employment and housing discrimination were particularly intractable, but in a number of Northern and border cities, as a result of CORE's efforts, discriminatory policies and public accommodations were permanently changed, and discrimination on some interstate, interstate train lines was banned. The courage of these early civil rights activists should not be underestimated. Violence, some of it quite brutal, was often used against them, even in the North, where segregation was supposed to be illegal. Although Hauser and Farmer had hoped that their efforts would result in a mass civil rights movement, Conditions then were not yet ripe, but in generating press attention, core activists informed and educated a wider audience about the nature of an institutionalized racism and strengthened the, resol strengthened the resolve of some of those affected by racism, either to question their own compliance with Jim Crow laws or to look with sympathy on those who refused to obey them. During the 1940s, when race in the northern and border states had become increasingly spatialized, insulating whites from the recognition of their white privilege, the work of Hauser and his comrades in exposing racial patterns served to remove a number of these blinders. As one of the journalists who accompanied them on the Freedom Ride wrote, based on what I saw between Washington and Asheville, I think the journey of reconciliation knocked several props from, the, from beneath the already tottering Jim Crow structure. They wrote a new page in the history of America. And they paved the way for what was to come 
Most, most of those involved in these civil disobedience campaigns remained lifelong activists for racial justice. Some like Rustin and Farmer went on to be key leaders in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And the nonviolent training sessions designed by Hauser and Rustin would become the model for the nonviolent training sessions provided by Reverend James Lawson in the 1960s. Perhaps Hauser's most far ranging contribution to the struggle for justice in the latter half of the 20th century was his role in founding and leading the American Committee on Africa. The fourth chapter in the book covers Hauser's move from core to the beginnings of his interest in Africa. He became intrigued by Africa after a pacifist friend of his, Bill Sutherland, returned from a trip through Europe where he learned about the impending ANC defiance campaign. While, while still working for CORE, Hauser then began corresponding with leaders of the defiance campaign, offering to help their struggle. Among them were figures such as Albert Luthuli, who was then head of the ANC, Patrice Zulu, Secretary General of the ANC, and Yusuf Kachalia, Secretary General of the South African Indian Congress. The result was the formation of Americans for South African Resistance, or ASFAR. Armed with insider information from the freedom struggles, ASFAR managed to raise some funds to send to the South African freedom fighters and to publicize what was going on in, in South Africa. In the early 1950s, the only other US organization that had paid any attention to Africa was the Council on African Affairs, whose roster had included such people as Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary McLeod Bethune, and many others. However, this was in an era of intense anti-communism, and the council, which included some communists in its ranks, was the subject of severe persecution by the FBI and Justice Department. By 1955, it had ceased most activities, and by 56, it was shut down for good. This left Hauser and his small band of liberal non-communist pacifists to carry on the work of providing support for the African liberation movements. Hauser's group has been criticized by some scholars for refusing to work with the Council on Africa when it was still in existence. Hauser uh, apologized for that later, but it probably saved him from being hauled before the House on American Activities Committee, allowing him and his organization to carry on the work the council had begun. When the defiance campaign had to be shut down in 1953 because of severe repression, those whom Hauser had recruited to ASFAR's cause had to decide what to do. After much discussion, they decided to form another organization, the American Committee on Africa, which would not only work against the apartheid state, excuse me, but would seek to support the anti-colonial movements that were just beginning to emerge all over the continent. Most of the continent in 1953 was still under colonial dominance. An Afro-Asian effort to change the direction of the UN on colonial issues was just beginning, but it did little to change the status quo. The US State Department that was then enthralled to Cold War ideology had no Bureau of African Affairs, viewing African politics through the lens of their colonial allies and fearing the independence movements might turn to the Soviets for help. There were also no African studies departments in academia. To start an organization that focused on an entire continent with no funds and with a public that still thought of Africa as the dark continent must have seemed like a fool's errand. But because of his work for civil rights in the US, Hauser was uniquely positioned to serve as a liaison between the civil rights movement at home and African liberation abroad. He would eventually enlist all of the major Af African American civil rights leaders in the cause of African liberation. From 1955, when Hauser took on the role of executive director of ACOA through the end of South African apartheid in 1994, this small interracial 
always poorly funded organization would play a disproportionate role in introducing the leaders of emerging African independence movements to the world, in securing their international legitimacy, and in helping to build support for their causes. Starting out with little knowledge about Africa, Hauser would become one of the most knowledgeable Americans about the African independence movements. His extensive correspondence and discussions with African independence leaders whom he came to know intimately, the reports he brought back from his 34 trips through Africa during and after the wars for liberation, ACOA's support of African petitioners at the UN, as well as the US speaking tours he arranged for African independence leaders, represent an important but under-recognized trans transatlantic dialogue. This interaction helped shape liberal thinking on race and racism during the Cold War, informing how activists on both sides of the ocean initiated their strategies in the fight against racial and colonial injustice. Africa Today, the oldest continuous journal providing scholarly analysis and discussion of African affairs, which is now published by the University, uh, Indiana University Press, was launched by ACOA and the organization's extensive files and research on Africa were widely used by journalists, historians, legislators, and activists seeking information. Included in, this, in my book are not only discussions of Hauser's philosophy and methods of action, but stories of high adventure as he risked his life many times in support of his mission. His life is full of dramatic moments civil disobedience and frequent jailings, a 200 mile trek through the Angolan jungle and grasslands with a guerrilla group, a clandestine visit to South Africa under apartheid during which he was surveilled and interrogated, two harrowing rides across the Western Sahara with Muslims fighting for their independence from Morocco, a daring but unsuccessful attempt to fly into Namibia that was then controlled by South Africa <clears throat> having a gun pointed to the back of his head while observing Zimbabwe's first free elections. In his late seventies, traveling twice with pastors for peace to Cuba to deliver medicine and other supplies in violation of the US embargo. And at the age of 93, getting hit with tear gas from Israeli soldiers during a fact-finding trip to Israel, Palestine. Hauser not only helped to make history, but witnessed some of Africa's pivotal events. He was invited to all three of the All African People's Conferences, to the founding conference of the OAU, to several inaugural events or celebrations for newly elected African leaders, and served as an observer at some of Africa's first free elections. During each one of his trips, he kept extensive handwritten journals writing up detailed reports on his observations and the discussions he held with people he sought out from all walks of life. On his return, he would provide an analysis of the events he had witnessed to his supporters, for his supporters, American legislators, UN personnel, and the general public. These notebooks, reports, and congressional and UN testimony, in addition to a book he authored, No One Can Stop the Rain, Glimpses of African Liberation Struggles, which was published in 1987, provide illuminating insights into the trials, the triumphs, and the tragedies of the struggle for liberation throughout the continent. During his leadership of the ACOA, Hauser's role was often hidden in the collective policy decisions made by the board and steering committee, and in the materials produced by the ACOA ranging from thousands of pages of print to large public events, conferences, speaking tours, public demonstrations, boycott campaigns, material aid for the liberation movements and for families of political prisoners and refugees, exhibitions of African art and quiet dinners for African guests. Yet behind it all was Hauser's indefatigable energy responding to every crisis that came along with yet another action campaign. At his retirement, 
at Hauser's retirement, Judge William Booth commented, quote, to pay tribute to George is to recall a seemingly endless number of involvements. He is at the center of activity, hunting a new angle, meeting new people, trying a new strategy. Even his detractors testify to his commitment, unquote. He was a man who believed that persisting against all odds was the only way forward. Hauser retired from the ACOA in 1981 at the age of 65 with a gala celebration that was filled with testimonies from dozens of African leaders whom he had befriended over the years. He had always known that the struggle would be long and that he might not see its completion. Although his formal work with the ACOA was at an end, he was determined to continue the fight in other ways and would remain a peace and justice activist for the next 30 or so years. It was Hauser who in 1962 had catalyzed the only African-American-led organization to challenge US foreign policy, the American Negro Leadership Conference on Africa, until the emergence of Trans Africa in 1978. Hauser was also responsible for initiating many of the campaigns that would eventually help to bring an end to apartheid. Among the many were cultural and sports boycotts, the bank divestment movement, corporate shareholder resolutions, picketing of South African ships at US ports, the Krugerrand boycott, and many others. After his retirement, two South Africans whom he had hired Jennifer Davis and Gumasani Kumalo would carry on the ACOA's work for a free South Africa until its conclusion. Kumalo would later become free South Africa's first ambassador to the UN. When he started his work for social justice, Hauser couldn't have foreseen the fluorescence of his initial efforts to break the back of racial segregation, nor could he have foreseen the ultimate results of his efforts to get companies and investors, sports figures and artists to disengage from South Africa. He always refused to take credit for the subsequent developments that, the, that were the work of thousands of others in the US, Europe, and most significantly those in the American South and Africa who were daily laying down their lives for their freedom. Yet at a time of restricted space for dissent, his cultivation of action and advocacy had helped lay the groundwork for the eventual end of de jure racial segregation in the US and apartheid in South Africa. Throughout his career, Hauser had to face and overcome several challenges that might have dissuaded a lesser man. During the Cold War, at times he would be labeled a communist and terrorist by the South African and Portuguese governments. At other times, he had to weather accusations from the Marxist left that he was a CIA agent. Declared a prohibited immigrant, he would be barred from entering Britain's East African colonies. As a white liberal, he was often distrusted by the more militant elements in the black nationalist movement. As a committed pacifist, he had to wrestle with support for liberation movements that were forced to turn to violence. During the struggle for independence, he endured the assassination of many of his friends, among whom were some of the most promising active African leaders, and saw several others whom he had supported become corrupted. For someone so devoted to improving the human condition, the long arc of history Hauser had lived through could sometimes be unforgiving. If global peace for which he had worked all his life was still elusive, so was the cause of racial justice in the United States and the African self-determination he had worked so hard for failed to produce the peace and prosperity it had once promised. Looking back on such failures might have seemed a cause for cynicism, but Hauser rejected such an attitude. The struggle for a better person, a better life, a better country and a better world never ends he wrote, perhaps the moment of greatest freedom is found as we engage in the struggle to achieve it. And that moment is always with us. Okay. Bravo. Bravo.
uh, Dr. Collins, if we were together in the same space, you would hear thunderous applause right now. <laughs> but until such time, you have me. This is really, really wonderful. Thank you. And as you were talking, as, as people are gathering your questions, for which I hope you will certainly ask and start engaging in conversation with Dr. Collins, I'll just ask the first one. Okay. Um, so as you were chatting, I was thinking about sort of all the hell we're going through now, you know, and to think he was born in 1916 and all of the work. That yeah. And so we're looking at structural racism. We're looking at the trial that may end, um, you know, any day now. We're looking at the incident that happened on campus um, at Union just days ago, the symbol of- Oh, I heard about that. That's terrible. God. So all of this and his language to us is like not to become cynical, to sort mm -hmm. of keep on keeping on. And, mm -hmm. and so I find that comforting and I appreciate that. I wonder how does, um, you didn't talk a lot about his influ the influence of David Henry Thoreau. And this is, um, you know, Earth Week, uh, Earth Day would be on Thursday. And I wonder how did that, we understand how Gandhi influenced his work. But how did the naturalist also influence his work in this sense of nature? And I, I would imagine in some of his adventures in these places and still understanding the beauty or even civil disobedience, which uh, Thoreau talks a lot about. Yeah, I didn't find much reference to or any really reference to Thoreau, uh, interestingly enough. Um, he was deeply influenced by Gandhi. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I remember yeah. reading his obituary in the New York Times mm -hmm. and his son mentioned how his two heroes were David Henry Thoreau and oh. so Gandhi. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So we're ready for the first question. Uh, would you just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask away? I, I was in Yale. You know. I was at Union 63 to 67 and was part, we were, very, we were very energized back then. We held the withholding of tuition. We did demonstrations. I remember sitting outside Citibank uh, in a sit down demonstration and other things that uh, were a core piece of the activism of uh, students back then. Um, I'm, and this was wonderful because it fleshed out a story I certainly didn't know the, the depth and breadth of. Um, but since you're doing this for a union reunion event, um, anything more to say about his connection with union past the prison year? Yeah, yeah actually. <laughs> actually, he got the, one of the union alumni awards. Um, later in his life, even though he hadn't graduated from Union. Um, I think, you know, Union was a, obviously a very important influence on his life. Uh, he's, he's studying under Niebuhr and uh, Niebuhr was to have been his uh, thesis advisor, uh, but then Niebuhr, Niebuhr didn't support him when, uh, when he defied the, uh, refused to register. Um, so. Uh, wow. But I, you know, I, I know he always had a soft spot in his heart for union, but the, you know, in those days, the, um, in the 1930s, probably under the influence of Harry Ward, who was a radical, you know, social mm -hmm. gospeler to the left of Niebuhr, um, and, and, you know, influenced several of his students to go into the Communist Party. Uh, a number of students had brought negative pu publicity to the seminary, uh, which is why uh, Henry Sloan Coffin, who was then president while George was there, um, you know, worried about the negative publicity these students were giving to the seminary, especially at a time when Nazism was the, you know, big evil um, to be combated. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, he, I know he spoke at Union, uh, 
as I mentioned in my talk on a panel about the civil rights movement, uh, he was invited back to speak with my husband and I. So, um, and he, he uh, you know, he had interactions with students, union students, because he enlisted them in the anti-apartheid cause. Appreciate the story about Roger Finn and the connection too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating correspondence. It really is. And you can get it in the union, you know, archives. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Larry Miller. I started a class of 62 at Union. Then I became a Presbyterian Frontier intern in Kenya for two years. Ah. I knew John Collins quite well, and I think we, the two of us, have met at some point. Well, and, I was in your class. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I, you said he was prevented from visiting in East Africa. I wonder if, if uh, he had any influence in the liberation of East Africa from British colonialism. Well, he did. Um... He, had, he befriended Tom Maboya, who was a rising star in Kenya, and uh, sponsored two speaking tours um, for Tom in the United States. Uh, I, I, heard, I heard Tom Maboya speak at one of those before he was oh, assassinated. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then out of that, out of those speaking tours emerged the uh, airlift from Africa, which was the... Um, the uh, air, uh, airlifting of students from East Africa to the United States to study in U.S. colleges and universities. That that whole program emerged out of the out of uh, ACOA's activities with uh, with Maboya and and uh, George helped Maboya raise scholarship funds for these students. One of which was um, Barack Obama's father. <laughs> So that's been mainly his his contribution to the East African struggle. Thank you. But many of the actually many of the students who came on that airlift returned to Africa uh, and became prominent leaders in their in their countries. Some of them becoming you know government ministers and and others uh, you know finance and so forth. Uh, and Wangari Mathai, I think is <laughs> trying to remember her name, uh, the great environmentalist uh, was one of them. We did have some joined a little bit late. And just so you know, this is um, Professor Sheila Collins. Um, who is speaking of um, a book she has written, the biography of George Hauser, entitled Ubuntu, George M. Hauser, and the Struggle for Peace and Freedom on Two Continents. Dr. Um, so as we think about him, and we hope that our students are also going to have the advantage of seeing this presentation uh, a little bit later. What do you think he would say to today? Oh, I the person speaking. Um, what do you think he would say to today's students at Union? Oh, well, <laughs> keep on keeping on. Uh, being, I mean, I think he would say what I said at the end, um, that the greatest freedom is found in the struggle. Um, and um, it, he had a favorite hymn um, that uh, the words to which I'm not trying to think went something like uh, I, I don't know what lies ahead one step enough for me one step enough for me is important if I commit my life to something that is uh, truthful and, and in the service of humanity um, we can't know what the outcome is, but the struggle is important. And then what do you say to our students within that tension of the struggle was important, 
but so is progress. Right? Yeah. Well, actually, he, you know, I mean, he did accomplish a great deal. Indeed. And I think he also he also would say that you have to organize. You have to to um, organize collectively to make any significant change. Mm -hmm. But every any significant change is is also um, <laughs> provisional because um, the struggle for justice seems to never end. <laughs> this is John. <laughs> I came in late to join the group. I appreciate seeing you all. Welcome. I, class of 62 at Union and appreciated it very much. I'm, that's yeah. my, I, I was in that class too. <laughs> Good. Although I didn't stay at Union. I left after a year. Where did you go? Uh, I went back into English, which, which had been my undergraduate major, and got a master's at Columbia. Um, and then I went on to work for some national church agencies for a number of years. Uh -huh. yep. So Jim just put something in the chat. Jim, would you like to talk about that, or should I read it aloud? It's up to you. And at our, we served a church in, San, in Brewster, New York, and knew George Hauser's son, Steve. Oh, did you? Steve? Yeah, Steve's a wonderful guy. Yes, he was a good friend. Yeah. Part of the congregation. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I, um, Jim ran through class of 82. And uh, during the late 70s, I was working as an intern at Clergy and Laity Concerned, and I see my former boss here, John Collins, <laughs> uh, who I haven't seen in decades. Um, <laughs> but I remember there must have been some event in, at which George Hauser was, was there, and I just, my image was he kind of bounded into the room, and he had lots of energy. I can't remember the, the topic or the event or the place. Um, but, uh, it, it seemed that, uh, and I, I, of course had heard his story about being a student at union and having gone to prison. So, um, I, I'm just glad that, to hear more about it today. And thanks for your presentation. Hmm. <laughs> That's John. The union say he was not allowed to come back when he came out of federal prison. Or did he just prefer not to bring any back? No, they were told they couldn't come back unless they promised not to, you know, engage in any um, activity that would bring negative publicity to the seminary. And none, none of them refused to promise that. So none of them went back. We have about five more minutes, which means we have about five great questions folks can ask. I, Sheila, I just have a question. Uh, yeah. This incredible life on multiple continents, and you mentioned that he had a son at least. So, what was it like being a family with George <laughs> Hauser? With well, his... I, I wrote a bit about that in in the book. Um, yeah, he was away a lot. I mean, he would take extended, you know, months long trips to Africa. Um, so his wife, Jean, really held down the fort at home, but they lived in a uh, multiracial uh, cooperative community in Rockland County uh, so that the family, he had four children, um, and Jean had a great deal of community support uh, to, to enable him to take these long trips. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But he was... He was a uh, wonderful father by all reports. He was, he was coming, at, when he was younger, he was somewhat stern with his children in terms of getting them to do chores and, and living up to the, you know, his principles. <laughs> um, but uh, he could also be very playful. And um, his son, Steve, has often talked about the kind of, uh, playfulness that his father engaged in with his children. His daughter, uh, Marty, uh, just adores her father. I mean, well, 
Steve does too, but uh, you, you can tell from the way they talk about their father that he, he was a wonderful father. Thanks. Unlike many men devoted to causes who, you know, kind of neglect their family. I mean, he, he, he really didn't, he was away a lot, but he, you know, he was very present and they, the family took long trips together, uh, camping, did a lot of camping together and hiking. Um, so that kind of kept them bonded. Susan. I think Riley, Riley, you're muted. So I think you have a question, but you may want to unmute yourself. Thanks, Riley. Oh, oh please go right ahead. Um, I think Riley is okay. Riley's okay. <laughs> One of those dumb things, sorry. Uh, would you say a bit more about what his relationship was to the civil rights movement in the 60s, to the anti-Vietnam work, uh, uh, his relationship, say, to King, or involvement with the uh, speech by King at uh, Riverside Church coming out against the war, et cetera. Well, he, he was very, uh, still very actively involved with civil rights leaders uh, in the 1960s, mainly uh, incorporating them into his work on, on Africa. So the, the work in Africa became all consuming, as you can imagine, uh, <laughs> dealing with an entire continent and traveling so much. But uh, he, you know, as I mentioned, he had started the only uh, African-American led uh, foreign policy organization dealing with foreign policy before the emergence of Trans Africa. Uh, <clears throat> so that was mainly his involvement with the civil rights movement of the, of the 60s. Um, but he was very much, you know, in, in support of the anti Vietnam War protesters, uh, although he couldn't devote a lot of time to it. But uh, that's where his sympathies lie, lay, of course. Where was he living during that time? He was living in Rockland County in this cooperative, you know, community. He, he and his wife were active members of clergy and laity concern in Rockland yeah. County. And he also vigiled against the Vietnam War uh, every week in his local community with a, a group of neighbors. Where is, where is Rock, Rockland County? It's, it's uh, just, it's outside of New York, kind of north, west of New York City. If you go over the Tappan Zee Bridge, you're in it. Mm -hmm. Right by Nyack, New York. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Collins, on behalf of all of us, thank you. I think I'm going to give David uh, Bennett the last word here. And what he said in the chat, I think, speaks for all of us. He says, splendid presentation, Sheila. Thank you so much for your effort to lift up such a great contributor to the cause of justice and peace. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, I think it was so glad to have the opportunity. All right, there's a brief survey. If you click on that survey, although the, um, this program will end, you'll be able to fill out that survey. We encourage you to do so. And we look forward to you joining us at the next activity. Thank Dr. you. Collins. Dr. Collins <laughs> and Cousin Collins, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate you. <laughs>